in Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. Man, what happened to the warm weather we had? I thought we got out of winter. Just one day. Six inches of snow next week. Well, at least Aurora. <laughs> I was hoping we were done with all the snow too, but it is, uh, it is not even March yet. Colossians chapter 3. Uh, it, the other week, uh, there were a few guys talking, and they were, they were talking about some, some glue that they had bought. Uh, and I, I can't stay awake past about 9 o'clock anymore anyways, but, you know, those late-night infomercials where they're advertising just all of the, the, the odd kind of things, and, and they were talking about this adhesive that they had bought, and, and one of the guys had a chance to use it on his kid's toy. His son broke his toy. Man, his son was devastated, and he just wanted his toy fixed. And so... His dad takes this adhesive, this, this bonding agent that he had gotten, and, and, and he started to apply it, and, and, and he put this, this, this bonding agent and put the toy back together and followed all the instructions, did everything he was supposed to do. Gives it to his son. Five minutes of playing with it. Toy was broken again. The bonding agent did not hold. As much as they would advertise uh, how perfect this adhesive is, uh, how, how Superman himself, if you were to bind his hands together, w wouldn't be able to separate it. The bonding agent seemed to have fail in, uh, uh, failed in this particular case. This, this kid was devastated. His toy was broken. Uh, the bonding agent just didn't hold. Uh, tonight I want to talk to uh, a little bit tonight about the perfect bond of the church. The perfect bond of the church. Uh, we're going to read the first 13 verses of Colossians chapter 3 here, uh, and then we'll pray and get going. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. For which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience, in the which ye also walked some time when ye lived in them. But now ye also put off all these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds, and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. Where there is neither Jew, uh, Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, but Christ is all and in all. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness, uh, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. Father, we come to you tonight and uh, Lord, uh, just ask that, uh, Father, you would uh, hide me behind your cross. Uh, Lord, do what I can't do. Take your word and, and penetrate a heart tonight. Uh, Father, your word won't return void. Uh, and I pray that, God, it would go forth and find entrance into each and every heart here tonight. Uh, Lord, I ask that you would just be with uh, Pastor and Mrs. Randall. And, uh, Lord, we just continue to lift them up to you. We pray for Mrs. Randall that you would just uh, give comfort to her. I pray that the uh, the, the medication would be effective in, in managing the pain for her. Uh, God, I pray that, uh, uh, Lord, you would continue to bring healing, uh, not just as uh, uh, the, the surgery, healing from the surgery, but from 
Uh, all that was done and had taken place over the last several years. Thank you for the good report. We praise you for that. And, and God, I pray that that is just the beginning of the good news that we hear as a result of this surgery. Uh, Father, bless tonight. Be with each and every uh, uh, class that's going on, master clubs, uh, each and every uh, uh, preacher that's uh, proclaiming your word tonight. God, I pray you'd use them in, in just in a mighty and powerful way. Uh, Lord, speak to hearts, I ask, in Christ's name. Amen. The, the church, everything that God is doing today, he is doing through the local New Testament church. I'm, I'm all for uh, charitable organizations. I'm, I'm all for uh, organizations that are doing good things for people. But uh, one must understand that, that God is not doing his work through those charitable organizations, through Meals on Wheels. He uses the local New Testament church to accomplish all that he's doing. It is the church that God gave the Great Commission to. It is the church that is supposed to carry forth the gospel of Christ. And so God is doing all that he is doing through the local New Testament church. The devil, he doesn't like the church. The devil is striving and he is trying to tear down the church. He's trying to uh, 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 ruin the church. Any gospel preaching church out there has a target on its back and the devil is trying to tear it down. The church is the instrument of God and without the church, the work of God doesn't get done. And so tonight I want to look at the bond of the church. But before you can apply that bond before uh, uh, that man was able to take the parts of the toy and put them together, there was some preparation that had to be done. There were some things that just needed to get taken care of uh, before it was ready to receive that bond. So tonight we see here in Colossians chapter 3, we see a list. Uh, I was thinking about it. The Apostle Paul would not have uh, gathered, I don't think, very many people in a crowd that he would preach at. People don't like sins being named. They just don't like it anymore. And so the Apostle Paul, man, he, he just lists them out. He just writes them all down for us. And I'm not so sure he'd draw much of a crowd in 2023 today, but uh, he gives us a list of things that we must put off. Uh, verse number five uses the word mortify and and that means to put to death. Uh, in verse number 8, you see the term put off. I don't want to make a, a big deal about the difference between those two tonight. Uh, in both of the cases here, these are things we need to get out of our lives. Okay, these are things that just have no part in the life of a Christian. And so uh, I'm not making a big deal about the difference. We just need to get these things out of our lives. Amen? And so what we put off. What do we need to put off? Um, the opening verses of the chapter, they point out to us that we are risen with Christ. Verse number one, if ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above. Verse number two, there tells us that Jesus is our life. That Jesus is our life. And because we are risen with Christ, we are to seek those things which are above. We are to set our affection upon things above, not on things on the earth. Uh, there are people that they just seem to constantly struggle with sin. Uh, they, they never seem to get victory over sin in their life, and, and day after day after day, they live defeated. They live a defeated Christian life, and that's not the life that God uh, has intended for anybody to, to live. Uh, how is it that a person can constantly gain victory? What is it that we're to do? It says that we are risen with Christ. It says uh, that he is our life. And in that same context, it's telling us what? To set our affections on things above. To seek the things that are above. Uh, temptation in and of itself isn't a sin. It's the succumbing to the temptation. It's the giving in to the temptation when, when things become sin. Uh, and we need to realize tonight that as we are risen with Christ, uh, we are to set our affection on those things above, and we are to, to, to seek those things that are above. 
because the things of, the, of this earth, the things that, that the world tries to convince us of uh, is, is what our life should be and what makes us happy and what makes us joyful, the, the things that the world would constantly put in front of you to say, this is your, your happiness, this is what it is that, that you want. Those things, the things that we're going to list here tonight, that is food for the flesh. These things that the Apostle Paul listed out to the Colossi church, they are life support for the dead man. When you live in these things, when you allow these sins into your life, you are keeping the dead man on life support. You are allowing the man that you are to have put off to stay alive and to stay influencing you in your life. As long as Sin, as long as these sins are part of your life, the old man will never die. You keep seeking the world, you're going to find yourself caught up in all these sins that were listed here tonight. But you can't just, just uh, seek those things which are above. Uh, you've got to mortify the sins. You've got to put off the old man. And, and it's those two things that must be done simultaneously. You, you can't you can't seek things above and allow sin into your life and, and continue to allow the, the, the different sins that are listed here to be part of your life. Uh, you can't not seek things that are above but put off the old man. These are two things that must be done together. The Apostle Paul used the word in uh, 1 Corinthians 15, or the phrase, I die daily. The Apostle Paul said he dies daily, and when he said that, what he was saying uh, to the Corinthian church there was, uh, he was trying to communicate and trying to express to them that Jesus Christ, in fact, is risen. He's stating the fact that he has seen the resurrected Christ and that Christ is risen, and because of Christ's resurrection, because of the fact that Christ has risen uh, from the dead, it was worth it for him to die daily and to live in Christ. And tonight, that is true for us tonight as well. Our lives are not in the things of the world. Our lives are not to be found in the sins of the world. Our peace, our joy, our happiness is not to be found in those things. We have Christ. And we have a living Savior. When it comes to the, the things of the world, again, they're telling us that's what we need. They're telling us that, that that is the thing to do, the phrase, uh, you only live once. You know what? I don't disagree with that phrase, that you only live once. Make the best of it. Christian, we have one shot at life. We only live once. We must as, as, as well make the best of our Christian life, a Christian they can live physically. They can carry on for a number of years and, and physically live, but be caught up in all of these sins, all the sins that we're going to talk about here in a minute. The wages of sin is death. Always has been, and it always will be. You want a defeated Christian life. You want a, a life that bears no fruit then you live in the sin. And you will produce as much fruit as a dead tree produces in your Christian life. So you can carry on for a long period of time and you can physically live, but be dead spiritually. Be dead, not producing any fruit, just like the dead tree doesn't produce any fruit. So I don't want to spend a lot of time on any one of these uh, particular things uh, that you see listed up on the screen. We're going to move through them fairly quickly, but as I was going through and studying this out, and as I was considering that 2,000 years ago, the Apostle Paul felt it necessary to name these things. And here we are 2,000 years later, and as, as the Bible describes what would happen throughout the course of time, the Bible says that this earth is going to wax worse, and worse. So if it was necessary 2,000 years ago 
it's necessary here tonight. And so uh, we're going to go through each of these things. And, and listen, I, I don't know of any situations in the church. Uh, I'm not trying to preach to anybody. I'm just, this is what the Bible says. These are the verses that the Bible gives in this passage. And so uh, I'm not, not calling anybody out. I don't know of anything. But I will say that if there's some here tonight or one here tonight that is caught up in one of these sins, and just get it right. Just get it right. Be done with it. Uh, seek forgiveness. Move on and move forward for the Lord. And the action of the church, we find in Galatians. Brethren, if a brother be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one. So if you're finding yourself caught up here in some of these things tonight, let's get it settled. It, you're going to be glad you did, and it's going to make the church stronger because of it. So first of all tonight, the first one we're going to look at is fornication. Uh, fornication is, uh, it is defined as sexual immorality. Uh, that is what the word itself means. I define fornication, or the way that I look at fornication, is the... Uh, the fulfillment of any sexual desire outside of the bonds of marriage. The fulfillment of any sexual desire outside of the bonds of marriage. Many in this room tonight uh, could probably remember a time when sex between a man and a woman outside of marriage was not accepted in society. That that was hidden in society. Sex between a man and a woman was hidden in society, and tonight... We live in a country where if you don't accept a person's sexuality of any form and between anything, then you are rejected. You are the one that is wrong. We uh, have a nation that is in trouble. Understand, fornication, uh, again, the fulfillment of a sexual desire outside of marriage, fornication is a direct attack on the family. God gave sex as a blessing to a husband and a wife, and that alone. And it is an attack out, uh, on the family for it to be outside of marriage, to be done in the way that it is done today. And, and how is it that you can have a strong nation, and how is it that you can have strong churches if you don't have a strong family? Satan has been attacking the family for decades and decades, and unfortunately, in many cases, he is winning. And the family is being destroyed, and we see it all through America, just broken home after broken home. And it's affecting our nation, and it's affecting our churches. And what's sad about this, and not just fornication, but all the ones to follow, who did he write this to? He wrote it to the church. He had to deal with these things in the church. And that is sad that 2,000 years ago, the churches were already in a mess. So fornication. Next, he lists uncleanness. This refers to impurity of thought, word, or action. This is moral filth. Things like cheating the boss of time. Uh, we would describe this a person, an unclean person, as an unethical person. They just, they just don't have good morals. They're, they're dishonest towards people. They, they're taking advantage of people. That is what uncleanness is referring to here. Inordinate affection. This refers to strong and uncontrolled lust. It is exciting sexual impurity. So this is someone that just wants to lust. Sexual lust. They just want to to lust. They, they excite that emotion in their, in their hearts and, and they, they seek after the ability to lust after uh, men would lust after a woman. And sadly, a man doesn't have to go very far to find an opportunity to lust after a woman. Next is evil concupiscence. Now this one is the one that's going to make you all so much smarter. You finally get to know what concupiscence means. The e this is evil desires, lusts, and passions. So while this one's akin to inordinate affection, inordinate affection is focusing more on sexual lust. 
and sexual passions. And, and this one is more broad. It's, it's speaking to just uh, a, a, a struggling thought life, a thought life that isn't right with God, a thought life of, of uh, maybe anger towards people, bitterness towards people, uh, 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 just, uh, just a thought life that is uncontrolled without any kind of, of uh, uh, stopgap. St- no, I'm not going to think that. This is just an unhinged thought life. The thought life is, uh, is a battle, folks. It's a struggle. We all struggle with the thought life. Every single one of us at, at one point or another, uh, throughout a, the course of a day or throughout the course of a week, man, there's going to be an attack. Satan loves to attack our thought life, does he not? He, he loves to go after our thoughts and and the problem with the thought life and the problem with the, the, the one that doesn't deal with it, doesn't invoke 2 Corinthians 10.5, casting down imaginations, the one that allows the thought life to be unchecked, the problem is it's only in the heart for so long before it comes out in an action. It can only stay in there for so long before the heart converts it, and, and, and a, a person converts what's in the heart into an action. Our, our prayer should be one that matches the psalmist's prayer. In Psalm 51.10, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. We need to have clean hearts. And if you aren't battling the thought life, if, if you allow the thoughts that the devil tries to put into your life to stay in your life or to stay in your heart and to stay in your mind, man, you are going to live a defeated life. You are going to struggle with sin, and it isn't going to be long before those thoughts become actions. The thought life is a battle that we all must be engaged in. Next is covetousness. This is just discontentment, always wanting more never being satisfied with what they have. So how bad can covetousness really be? Make God's top ten. He put it in his top ten commandments. Thou shalt not covet. So that's the first set. The, the, the next set there, if you drop down to verse 8, but now, all, but now ye also put off all these things. So in addition to all the things that he's already mentioned, that we are to, to mortify or to put off, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communications out of your mouth. So verse 8 uses the term put off. Anger, wrath, and malice, you understand these, these words, but how is it that these ones rise to the same level as fornication in the church? We would... We would all be appalled to to find out of some uh, uh, scandal of fornication in the church. But anger, one person just losing their temper towards another person, we might excuse. So how is it that, that the Apostle Paul puts these in the same chapter and wants us to deal with them in the same way? Why is it that these rise to the same level? Proverbs chapter, Chapter 6, the Bible says, Six things doth God hate, yea, seven are an abomination unto the Lord. And the seventh thing that is listed there in Proverbs chapter 6 is, He that soweth discord among the brethren. These three, is, and the next uh, few to follow after this, these are the kinds of sins that the devil uses to put strife and contention into the church. This is how the devil divides the church, through anger, through wrath, and malice. I've already mentioned that, the, that God is doing all that he is doing through the local New Testament church. And so God must protect the church. God must deal with sins in the church, and that is why anger, wrath, and malice are so dangerous for a church. That these things must be put off. They must be put out of our lives because Without the church, the work of God doesn't get done. How many relationships have been ruined or strained 
because an uncontrolled anger. Words were spoken towards somebody else. Or a person uh, uh, does some sort of action against somebody else in their anger and wrath towards them. Words that can't be taken back. Actions that can't be undone. Forgiveness can be given, and it should be given. But oftentimes, one or both of the parties don't want forgiveness. They don't want to get right. They, they don't want to do what is right and resolve the problem. And so, there's le- and so the church or the individuals are left with strife and contention. Proverbs 25, 28, uh, I think every parent, grandparent should memorize this verse uh, and help your, your child or your grandchild apply this verse to their life. He that hath no rule over his own spirit is like a city that is broken down and without walls. Um, I'm not necessarily intending to make a political statement here tonight, uh, but open borders is not a good strategy. It's not going to work out well for the country. A city that has no walls, a country that has no walls, uh, a nation without borders is a nation that is doomed to fall. So is an individual without self-control. Just as a nation will fall without borders, a man will fall without self-control. With, with, with anger and wrath, these are uncontrolled people. These are people that have no self-restraint. And just like a nation will fall without borders, so will a man. Blasphemy. We hear blasphemy and we, we tend to think speaking evil towards God or uh, 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 just things that are anti-God, against God. But the word here means, and I didn't come up with the definition. Some definitions are more helpful than others. But this is the definition for blasphemy. Contemptuous irreverent, deliberate, and insolent utterance of defamation and slander. Did it help? Did that, that definition? <laughs> I needed a bunch of definitions for the words that the definition used. Um, it was a little bit of a, a, a challenge there to get through the definition there and understand it, but blasphemy, of course, can be against God, but it can also be against another person. You can slander another person. You can tear down another individual. You can uh, speak lies of others. And, and, and that carries right into the next one, filthy communications, where uh, uh, this is just constantly negative talk towards people and about people. Uh, a Christian ought to use their tongue to build up one another. We should be using our, our, our communication to build others up, not to tear others down. Lying. The Apostle Paul is lying here, but what struck me is that he didn't just say, lie not. That the Holy Spirit of God moved the Apostle Paul to say, lie not one to another. I said, does this happen in a church where people are lying to one another? I can't imagine there's ever been a church split without people lying to one another. It's sad that God lists these sins and he has to speak it and he has to to communicate this to a church. If I'm right, uh, this list or a list like this list was written to every one of the New Testament churches. That it was found in every single epistle written, written to the New Testament churches. 2,000 years ago, these were problems in the church. I'm not saying these are problems in our church. I don't think that these are problems at Elmwood Baptist Church. But the church that, that is in America today, the average church that is in America today, so many of them are rampant with these problems. So many of them have... So many people caught up in these different sins. And friend, it doesn't matter how good the bond is. 
if the surface isn't clean, if what you're bonding together has not been purified and taken care of, the bond is going to fail. It's going to fail every time. And so we must, we must purify the, the members. We must put off these things uh, and put to death these different things in order to prepare the surface. But you see, we can't just put stuff off. We're about to bond something together. And so we should put together some things that we want, some good things, some things that are going to build the church, some things that are going to help the people of the church. And so the apostle also lists here what we should put on. Verses 12 and 13, Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. Uh, listed here for us are some things that a church should be known for. Uh, I'm sure you've all, as you go out and uh, you invite people to church or you try to encourage people to come to church, oftentimes you're going to hear something. They're going to respond with, I, I don't really like churches. Churches are full of hypocrites. And you know what? They're not wrong. In a lot of churches, they're not wrong. And that's sad that that is the testimony of the churches. It shouldn't be that way. The solution, though, and it's, it's not to quit preaching on sin. It's, it's not to... To, to take the approach that so many other uh, churches have taken where, well, they're just going to avoid certain things. They're, they're not going to call out the sins in, 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 a, in a person's life. They, they're not going to do the Apostle Paul approach here and lay them all out. They're going to avoid those things. But here's the, here's the thing. There are still people out there. There are people that, that uh, they have lived those sins. They have lived the fornication. They have lived the, the evil concupiscence. They have lived all those sins and they're broken. And their lives are a mess and, and, and their lives are turned upside down and, and they want something different. They want something where they can, a place where they can come to and, and get away from all that. They don't want to come to a place that's the same as where they're coming from. That didn't work for them. That turned their life upside down. That made their life a mess. There are still people that are walking through the doors of the church that want something that the world can't offer them. And that ought to be the testimony of the church. That we are different. That we have, uh, uh, we have the Word of God is what we have to offer them. But we have something that the world doesn't have. So as they come seeking, as they come desiring for a change, because fornication ruined their marriage. Because everybody's lying to them and speaking evil of them and they want something different. The church should be that for them. The church should have these things. The church should put on uh, bowels of mercy is the first one that's listed there. That's compassion. But it's not just a superficial compassion. This is a, a deep emotion. This is a, a compassion that when you hear of a a need that someone else has, or you hear someone hurting or going through something, that it affects you. That your emotions are also affected by it. And that you're driven to help them. It lists out kindness. Titus chapter 3, verses 4 and 5 says, But after that, the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. Jesus, was he not kind to us? Are you ever going to find a better demonstration of one's kindness? Are you ever going to need to give such kindness to someone else as he had to give to us? No. He's the greatest, greatest uh, demonstration of kindness. Ephesians 4 we all know that one tells us that we're to be kind one to another. The next thing it lists out there is humbleness of mind. Nobody stepped down further than the Lord did for us. The King of kings, the Lord of lords, left heaven's throne for poverty 
for shame, to be rejected. Is it too hard for us to serve God in some some simple way? Is it too much for us uh, to, uh, to, to lower ourselves to serve another person? He is an example to us. And then meekness. Meekness is power under control. This is using one's strength for good. So a, a person that has some sort of power or authority, but it's not self-serving. It's used for the benefit of others. It's in control and that they use it for right and good things. Long-suffering. Uh, is God not long-suffering to us? How often do we, and don't raise your hands, but how often is it that we go to God multiple times in the same day for the same thing? We just keep messing up and, and we go back to God and we say, God, I did it again. God, I, 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 I fell again. And never once has God gotten angry at you over it. Never once has God uh, uh, rejected your plea for forgiveness. Never once has He even delayed His forgiveness. But He's right there. Long-suffering uh, toward us. Long-suffering toward the lost, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And then forbearing one another. This means to hold back. Uh, God holds back His judgment on us at times. When we don't deserve Him to hold back, He forbears even when we don't deserve it. Forgiving one another. You joined an imperfect church full of imperfect people. Imperfect people are going to let you down at some point. At some point, someone's going to do something that, that's going to hurt you. Probably not even intentionally. But at some point, because we're an imperfect church full of imperfect people, there's going to be some hurt. There's going to be something that happens, something that takes place, but bitterness, anger, retaliation, that'll never bring healing. Forgiveness will. Forgiveness will bring healing. I've already talked how God uses this, the, the New Testament church and, and that the, the testimony of the church is so important. Because it will either be what propels the work of God forward or it's going to be what cripples the work of God. So the testimony is so very vital. Again, people, they want an escape. They want something that the world can't offer them. They're living in a world full of all of these sins, and it's not working out for them. And so there are people that want a refuge, want somewhere to come where they can, they can find something different for them. And that ought to be the testimony of every church. I think it is the testimony of our church. We have a great church, but uh, not every church can say this. But you know, friend, we clean up, we put off all those things, the fornication, the, the inordinate affection, uh, we put off the anger, the wrath, and the malice. We, we do all the work to clean up. We clean, the, the broken toy is, is cleaned, we've put some things on, we, we've taken some things, and, and we've put it together. We've, we've got forgiveness and, and forbearance and and uh, there's compassion that we have. And so, so while we've cleaned off the things, we've put off some things, and we've put on some good things, understand something. Without something to hold it all together, it's all going to fall apart again. Doesn't matter, how perfect a, uh, 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 doesn't matter how perfect a church can be right now. Without the bond that holds it all together, it's just going to fall apart. It's just going to all come crashing down. And so... This was the message tonight. This is, this is what, I, what I wanted to convey tonight, is that there is a bonding agent. There's an agent that, that will put everything together and will hold it together. It is the perfect bonding agent. Verse 14 of Colossians chapter 3. So we put on all these other things, but above, or and above, all these things put on charity which is the bond of perfectness. This is love. This verse 
when the Bible said, above all, this verse is speaking of a covering. One commentator said it's like the outer garment, it's like the robe. And so uh, the, the parts and, and the pieces, they're all cleaned and they're all uh, there, ready to be assembled. They're all, all, all ready to be bonded together. And love is the garment that goes around it all and holds it all together. Above all, we are to put on love. Without love, we will lose our compassion. Without love, we're going to lose uh, 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 our, our kindness. And without love, there will be no forgiveness. And so while we need to put all these things off and we need to put good things on, if we don't bond those things together, then we're going to lose all of those things. Everything is going to come crashing down and falling apart. Charity, of course, it's love, but it's not just love as a feeling. This is love in action. This is demonstrable love. Things that we do to show that we love each other. These are uh, uh, self, this is a self-sacrificing love. That is what charity is. Giving oneself for the benefit of another. I, I believe we have a loving church. Amen? I, I think this church is, is absolutely loving of one another. We joke, don't we, that uh, as visitors come, uh, if you keep coming, you're going to stick around. You know, if you, if you keep coming before long, you're going to stick. Why? Because love is the perfect bond. Because they'll see a church full of people that love one another. I, I, I think we have a very, very loving church. And I, I tried to come up with a better analogy, uh, and I just, I couldn't. I couldn't come up with something better than this, but, but think of love as a resource. Okay, it's, it's a resource that we have, and uh, as with any resource, if it is put on the shelf, if it is left to itself, it is useless. A resource is only worth something. It is only valuable if it is put towards something. And so, quickly here tonight, there are three things that we should put our love towards. The first is towards the lost. We're Bible believers, are we not? I hope you are. You're in the wrong church if you're not a Bible believer. As Bible believers, what is the result of an unsaved person's condemnation? We believe that an unsaved person will spend eternity separated from God in a place called hell. Our love for lost people should compel us to do something about it. Love will stand in front of that person and force that person to go to hell through you. They won't let that person go to hell standing on the side watching them just go too, too concerned about our feelings, too concerned about uh, what they might think about us or uh, letting our fears overcome us. Love will stand in the way between a lost person and hell. How's your love for the lost? Where is your demonstrable actions to say, I care? We should have charity. We should have love for the lost. We should have love towards God. What good is a church without a deep abiding love of God? What good is a church that doesn't have that? God is to be the motivation behind everything we do. Everything we do ought to be because of a love for God. You say, well, I serve at the church. Hey, amen, we need help. We need more help than we got right now. I serve at the church. Great. But what's your motivation? Is your motivation because you have a Savior that died for you and that He first loved you and so you love Him? Is your motivation uh, because you just want to do what you can do for the God that, that cares for you, that provides for you, because you love Him? Or is it because I'm supposed to? Because it's an obligation to do it. Listen, God's never going to want us to stop doing good things. And so uh, the, 
The solution here, if you're doing things because you're supposed to or because you feel like you had to, the solution here isn't to stop doing them, it's to get the motivation right. It's to understand that the reason you do what you do is for the Lord and out of a love for Him. No one should be quitting. We should just be getting our motivations right. How's your love for God in your personal life and your walk with Him? There's a lot of saved Christians. There's a lot of people, they've believed on God for salvation. They've, uh, they've put their faith and trust in Jesus, but that's all they wanted out of it. No desire to know God better, no desire to uh, hide His Word in our hearts, no desire to draw closer to Him or to draw nigh unto Him. There's a lot of Christians that they don't want anything more than the get out of hell free card. How is your love for God? Are you lacking a genuine love for God? Is it demonstrable in your life? Are there actions, are there sacrifices that you make in love towards God? And then towards each other. 1 Peter 4.8 says, And above all things, have fervent charity among yourselves, for charity shall cover a multitude of sins. I, I already mentioned, uh, we are an imperfect church. Uh, hang around long enough, and you're going to find out how imperfect we are. Hang around a pastor long enough and you're going to find out how imperfect a pastor is. Say, so what's going to happen when, when someone hurts you, when someone wrongs you? Well, when there's love, love will hold it together. Love will express forgiveness. Love is going to express uh, an understanding, a forbearance, uh, towards that person. Love is what will keep it together. But without that love, without love for one another, when the hurt comes, man, it's going to be real easy just to walk out on them. It's going to be real easy to retaliate. But love, love would prevent that. I know, I, again, I know this is a loving church. And we can be content with where we are. We've had pastors come through here and talk about the spirit of this church. And we can just sit back and say, man, we've already got it figured out. We're good. We've got this love thing down. Or we can take the admonition found in 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 9 and 10. But as touching brotherly love, ye need not that I write unto you. For ye yourselves are taught of God to love one another. And indeed ye do it toward all the brethren which are in all Macedonia, but we beseech you, brethren, that ye increase more and more. That ought to be our, our goal. That ought to be what we strive for uh, tonight and, uh, and going forward in our church. We can't sit back and say we're good with where, where we are. Man, we should increase more and more in the love that we have for one another. So how is your love tonight? How is your love towards the lost? Does it bother you? Years ago, I asked God for a burden for lost people, and, and since then, I, I hardly hear about somebody, whether I knew them or not, a celebrity, uh, some former athlete, somebody pa passing away. First thought that goes through my mind, where'd they go? Where'd they go? Maybe you need to ask God for a love for lost people tonight. That there's just not much action in your life demonstrating a genuine love for the lost person. How is it towards God? Maybe your, your walk with God has gotten cold. It, it happens. It, it happens uh, to, to probably every Christian at some point or another. Their walk gets cold. And their, their desire, their love for the Lord seems to, to wane a little bit. How is it tonight for you? Is there some work that you need to do, some things that you need to change in order to uh, increase that love you have towards God? And how is it towards one another? Nothing, nothing divides the church faster. Nothing causes problems in the church faster than when we're at odds with one another, when, when there is strife and contention in relationships in the church. 
So how's your love towards one another? Is there someone that maybe you need to get right with? Someone that you need to give forgiveness to? Someone that uh, maybe they've wronged you and you just need to turn it over to the Lord. Give, the, give your forgiveness and just, just put it in the past. How's your love towards one another tonight? How's, how's the, the, the sin life or the, the sins in your life? Do these describe you tonight as, as the Apostle Paul listed out all of those tonight? Maybe there's one or two that you struggle with. Let's get those things settled. Let's get those things done. They're going to they're gonna prevent that bond from holding the church together. They're going to they're gonna cause uh, a, a separation in the church. And so how is, how is uh, your testimony, your life, and, and, uh, and, and how, is, how is it uh, the things that you're putting on, how are those? Are you, are you putting on compassion in your life? Are you putting on uh, a forbearance and forgiveness towards one another? It can be one thing to have the absence of those sins in your life, but it's another thing to have the good. So we need the good in our lives as well.